Good morning and welcome to the last day of the New Zealand Game Developers Conference. It's lovely to have you with us for this special session. Um, my name is Mark Westerby, I am the Head of Attraction with Screen Wellington and it's my great pleasure to be interviewing Sir Richard Taylor. We're going to dive into some things this morning about Richard's history, where he's come from, how Work at a Workshop has been built up over the years and finally the foray into the games which uh, has led to the upcoming release of Tales of the Shire. So without further ado, let's get into it. Richard Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time out to have a chat to us and the game developers community about your life and your work. Um, we're here at Weta Workshop in the design library. This library used to be so frequently used and people would come and sit on the couches and take the books off and research and learn and read them. but. I don't think anyone ever does anymore because they don't need to. So, but I, I love books so much. I just hold on to the, the hope and uh, keep keep it here regardless. So let's cast our minds back. Where the workshop has been around for more than thirty years now. Um, I'm interested to know, uh, what was the catalyst for you to go down a creative path in your life? You know, what did you set out to do something else when you were younger? And did the creativity just blossom unexpectedly or was there an impetus for that? No, I, I never um, I never had any inkling to do anything else other than make things with my hands. Uh, I was never uh, particularly academic. I did okay at school because I made a real effort to try and do okay at school. Uh, but I didn't, um, I don't think I could have ever followed an academic career uh, and therefore there was really no choice for me other than to follow a creative career. Obviously when you're a young child you don't really understand the, the full scope of what's possible and uh, there was a narrative at the time that there was no future in the arts should you follow it and I certainly was hearing that from a number of quarters. Uh, the school I went to had no art class beyond the fourth form, so I was the first person to do art in the fifth, sixth and seventh form at that school and actually um, really strived to build an art class there along with the help of uh, the person that would ultimately become my art teacher. Uh, and I started taking uh, drawing classes in Auckland, so I'd get on a one-hour bus ride once a week from Pukekohe and um, shoot off up into Auckland to go and try and learn how to draw a bit better. Uh, and I was, um, my great love was three-dimensional model making. My parents were never dismissive of a potential future in the arts. It's just that they, they cared for me enough to worry that it wouldn't be an appropriate future because it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be a way to sustain myself. I was very fortunate that mum and my mother went back to the UK at one point. She kindly, I asked her if she could try and buy me an airbrush and airbrushes were crazy expensive, especially the one that she bought me. I can't imagine what proportion of her yearly wage it cost, but she bought me a, a, a DeVilba Super 63 um, photo retouching airbrush and I home built a, um, a pedal powered compressor and I'd sit at night time airbrushing and that that really got me caught up in, in that side of things as well as the sculpting I was trying to do and so on. So it was just natural that I was going to do art, yeah. And I, I didn't understand at all that the film industry existed. I want to go back to you were talking about that phrase that you heard when you were younger, you know, you can't make a business out of art, you can't make a career out of art. And it's certainly something I heard when I was growing up yeah. and my parents wanted me to have a degree and a safety net, you know, to be able to rely on. At what point for you did you sort of suddenly realise that that what you were doing with Weta and what you were doing with Tanya together was turning into a business, I suppose, or something mm. vaguely sustainable? Yeah, that's interesting. you think I... I would have had that epiphany, but it sort of creeps up on you. I, I don't know that to this day. I've actually given it that exact thought. Mm -hmm. it, it must be, right, we've had to form a board. Imagine that. You know, you've got a smaller uh, model-making effects company. You've got to actually put a board together. 
uh, to meet all of the New Zealand compliance laws and business expectations, etc. Uh, so that was a real serious waking up moment. The day we hired Dave, our general manager, because we just couldn't do it all ourselves anymore. Obviously, we had some senior managers around us, but we couldn't manage how clever they were by ourselves. So we need to, to hire a general manager in the form of Dave Wilkes, and that's been extraordinary and um, life-changing for us, just being able to hand some of that responsibility over. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure, actually. That's an, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think I wrote in my notes around the creative sector being this really interesting mix of, of risk and reward, um, particularly in, in the creative sector, it feels like the risk is a little bit higher sometimes because the output or the, the result is, is a lot more unknown in a sense. You know, how do you manage that idea of creative risk and reward in, in your business? Well, I would argue that there's no compromise on meeting the level of expectation that we collectively share here. So we don't go, oh, we've hit the full amount we can spend on this. If we spend any more, we're going to lose margin. We will work till we are entirely certain that we've met our expectation because if we've met our expectation and I guess specifically to some degree mine um, we're pretty confident that we will meet our clients expectation that's not always the case but more often than not uh, I'd say it's fairly rare that we've found that the client isn't happy with what we've provided because we will go to the ends of the earth and um, it's a fallacy to be chasing perfection, but you certainly should chase excellence. And, and that's what mm. we're trying to chase with this. So uh, when you quote on it, you know, one might ask, well, why didn't you charge the right price for what it cost to make? Because no one's ever built one of these before. But with commercial work, there is a deadline and there is a budgetary reality. So... Um, everything has some form of compromise in it where you've got to finally say, yep, this is good enough. Mm. But for us, that sometimes can be very liquid, <laughs> very flexible. How do you respond to the idiom, you're only as good as your last job? It's true. Yeah. In yeah. the industry that we work in, it's true. Uh, to some great degree, the problem with our industry, specifically the film industry, is often... The people that you worked with last year have moved on and there's new people in the same roles in this year and they've never worked with you. So yes. you've got to prove yourself. You've got to show that your portfolio of work has a, uh, is substantial and, and, and uh, has a depth of quality and... Uh, um, uh, quantity to it, I guess, and you, uh, you then also have to win the confidence of that individual. You know that a number of awards won, number of projects worked on uh, for a new client wanting something new from you, probably plays a very small part in it. It's mm. their confidence in the personable nature of you and your crew. Uh, how dynamically you're able to engage with them, how how well you listen to them. Uh, I think listening is grossly underestimated in a client uh, service provider relationship, and uh, uh, that's something that we try and be very attuned to. You know, some clients um, they may be extraordinary filmmakers, able to direct. Uh, actors and tell an incredible narrative um, through those actors but they may not necessarily have a visual eye and, and often will be very upfront about that where other directors are extraordinarily visual and are able to actually literally draw for you like Neil Blomkamp we've always said could make the whole movie himself if he had a thousand years right? because he, he has that skill mm -hmm. Um uh, maybe a hundred years, right? But uh, uh, but then some directors that you get to work with has a combination of all of them. When it's a new client, you don't know where they sit in that scheme of things. So you've got to feel that out in those first few minutes and hours. Mm. 
hard when you are on the other side of the world. Many of our clients, we don't meet in person. It's all phone calls. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask that about the geography of New Zealand. Like, in some ways, it's a great thing, but in other ways, it can be a challenge. Mm. Yeah, it can yeah. be a challenge. We've, we've built as many tools as possible, so it never is for the client. It may be for us. And then, uh, as you're aware, I, I'm traveling a significant amount of every year, as is a number of our team. Uh, one of our team is out on the road almost constantly, and that's because uh, we realized almost at the beginning of our career, or, or at least when we started working with international clients, um, it was beholden on us to get ourselves to them. Like, they must feel as if if they're working in Hollywood, we're in the Simi Valley. There's no further away than that because mm -hmm. it is only um, 10, 11 hours to get up to L.A. So if they want to see you the next day, we will be there the next day. Um, and if I can't be, someone else will be because that's the expectation of your client. And it's the make or break in some relationships because they want to know you're there personally. Mm. So I I go out of my way to try and uh, be present. And is that advice that you would give to other creative businesses as well? Be present, be well, there? Well, as much as, you know, some would want to hear, I mean, different companies operate in very different ways to ours, but if I was to do it all again, I would do it exactly the same way right. in this instance. Sure, yeah. Because yeah, um, it served us well. Uh, we do a lot of movies where we never meet the actor um, until we start filming, of course. Uh, so we've come up with the, a way to cyber scan actors on the other sides of the world. Uh, we'll ask the actor to go into a company that's local that cyber scans them. Mm. That digital data gets sent to us. We then mill out a replica of that person, we might mill out multiple replicas. To but him. this is the essence of running a business, isn't yeah. it? Solving these kind of logistical and creative problems on a daily basis, yeah. hourly yeah. basis hourly even. basis, yeah. yeah. No, you're shooting from the hip a lot of the time, just yeah. trying to solve things rapid fire. Um, you know, that your crew need to know that you're behind the wheel and Ultimately, whether you sail onto the rocks or into open sea, they must know that you're sailing, right? Uh, that you're actually making decisions. Hopefully, it's more frequently into the open sea. <laughs> uh, but even if you go up on the rocks, if you went onto them with the intent of staying at the wheel, people will forgive you and and uh, and get behind you and try and get the ship off the rocks and get going again, because uh, they just. People just need to know that you've got forward momentum, decisions are getting made. And that's easy to say. Obviously, sometimes, as we all do in our private and business lives, you get stymied by just the, the, the constant onslaught of decision-making that's required. Mm. And I myself find that not too frequently, but just for an hour or so, I actually become almost... Um, uh, bound up by the need to come up with another decision mm. and there's too many decisions to process that you um, you have to stop and think for a moment. How do you deal with that pressure and stress, Richard? Because it must be immense. <laughs> Let's is. be honest. Well, by sharing it, of yeah. course, with okay. others. Um, yeah. It is it, it, uh, uh, trying to be having a passion for what I do, mm -hmm. uh, like I can find a love in what I do, um, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, look through rose-coloured spectacles, whatever the term you like to choose, uh, trying, to, um, trying to leave the challenges of yesterday in yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like I try not to bring things forward uh, if they need to be dealt with for another day or another week, another year, of course, you bring them forward. Um, but try not to have them uh, weigh down your emotions, uh, which is easy to say and really hard to do. But I, I combat it by finding uh, joy in the craft of what we do and joy in the people that I'm doing it with. Right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, 
I walk around the workshop floor um, as many times a day as I possibly can interacting with the crew. Uh, if I'm doing a specific project, I'm doing one at the moment in robotics, so I'm interacting with that team multiple times a day. And that is a incredibly rewarding experience for me, and it can wash away a little bit of the angst that you might be feeling of in course. another yeah. quarter. So many people will have different opinions of the of the term work life balance. What's yours? How do you respond to that? <laughs> well, uh, yep. That's an interesting question. I I don't see a differentiation between the two yep. uh, because my work is my life. I, a very cliche thing to say. But no, I thought you'd say that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. of course, my work's my life. Uh, pre our children being born, because um, hobbies and overwork is selfish to children. So I had to be very uh, thoughtful in changing my approach to my work when the children were born. So I um, were, wasn't selfish to them. But uh, I, you know, pre the children, Tanya and I just never wanted to leave the workshop. You know, Lord of the Rings, we barely ever were home in daylight hours, not because that was a hardship that anyone expected us to carry. It's because we were just enjoying ourselves so much in the work at work. We have uh, we run a very active hobby between the two of us. So even though the weekends might be a good time to get the work-life balance correct, uh, we've transferred the work, almost identical work that we would do at work into our hobby at home or in the right. weekend. It's not at home, but it's in the weekend where um, that now occupies as intense a level of focus and energy and time as we put in during the five days at work. Uh, it's just different. Yeah. Well, that's not entirely a bad thing, I suppose, no, as long as you're enjoying it. Yeah, right? no, I do, exactly. Yeah. I am. I yeah. am enjoying it. We talked about film up until now. Where the workshop has seven divisions. Mm -hmm. at, at what point did you start to diversify out of film uh, into these other areas? And what was the jumping off point for those? Yeah, it's the end of Lord of the Rings. Yep. Two reasons. One, up until Lord of the Rings, we hadn't had uh, the appreciation that we could keep our team together. We had actually successfully kept our team mostly together. Other and how than, big was your team at that stage? Uh, 36 people. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, other than people that wanted to leave, um, we'd managed to get enough consistency of work that we hadn't had to downscale uh uh, and fluctuate too frequently. Uh, but when we got to the end of Lord of the Rings, we both felt a, a significant desire to try and keep as many of the team together as possible. And then because of the um, interest in Lord of the Rings and the notoriety of it, more and more people started to approach us. And these were amazing people that you want to work with and you want to offer employment to. So uh, that fueled our desire to try and find ways to do that. I, I've got a great love of um, model kits, six scale figure kits, then mm -hmm. I collect them from around the world and I paint them up, very nerdy. Uh, I'd been doing them on our dining room table for since we moved to Wellington, right? And mm -hmm. My office today has over 250 model kits lining the walls. It's almost imploding, as you've seen. Um, <laughs> And I therefore had an incredible inkling to want to make the collectibles for Lord of the Rings. But I really wanted to try and get a license for Lord of the Rings, and we were successful in doing so. That required us setting up a whole different arm to our business, our collectibles side of our business, which, although similar in some ways because of the model making to what we're doing in the screen industry, uh, incredibly different in the business model because mm. now you're you're manufacturing you're distributing you're having to sell to mum and pop stores online etc going to conventions all over the world it's actually been the most beautiful of uh, adjuncts to our core business 
because it keeps us attached to the IP of the project long after the movie finishes. If you're a little fanatical, as we tend to be, and I certainly tend to be, it actually is very sad when a project comes to an end, especially something like The Lord of the Rings. There was this huge sense of jubilation as the last shot was taken on Lord of the Rings. I actually fell into a six-month funk. I just felt so like something had just been torn away. But uh, it wasn't that we didn't have other work straight afterwards. It's just that I, I, I longed to be back in that that place working mm. in this world, right? So mm. getting to make the collectibles uh, connected us with the core fans of Middle Earth. It got us to conventions, at, uh, and it still does today, 25 years later. And we're still working on them today. We've got multiple licenses that we service. Um, it, it is a interesting business because... I do that. Like t this is what it's all about. It's all about touching the pulse of the popular culture of the world. And you think you've touched it properly, and you think you've felt that pulse, and you may have misread it, mm -hmm. and you you don't you you're not successful with a specific product line, and it bombs, right? Right. Or um, you have sensed it well, and it's wonderfully. Um, enthused by the fans and it's so lovely when it does and feels so fulfilling for the artists that are involved and so on so that's been a beautiful business to be involved in yeah. right. and so what led to your expansion into china and how difficult or easy was that from a business perspective new culture a different way of doing business when we won the license to make the Lord of the Rings collectibles, we did in partnership with another company who had a dish, who had a manufacturing relationship in China. So I flew up to China for the first time, crossed the border from Hong Kong into China, which is very different today than it was back then. I luckily uh, made very close friends with the man that ran the manufacturing factory. Uh, where we ended up making our collectibles, and he became one of my closest friends. I used to say he was half my height and uh, 10 years older than me, but we were like twins, very funny. <laughs> and him and I travelled China together, travelled the world together for various business opportunities. Uh, but he introduced me in a crash course into Chinese culture, Chinese business. Without him, it would have been a lot, lot harder. His name was Fred Tang been out to New Zealand. He was came out to New Zealand a few times. Sadly, he passed away last year. But uh, he um, was an extraordinarily generous person. Whenever I went to the factory, I'd stay in his apartment with him. And uh, him and I really started to push the boundaries of what we could do with collectibles. We came to the attention of central government because of the Sichuan earthquake we had heard the, the earthquake struck in Sichuan and we didn't have any relationship with that province or the city of Chengdu. But an expat Kiwi that was living up there that we'd connected with, uh, we we felt very compelled that we had to do something uh, coming from a shaky isle such as Wellington in New Zealand. So we um, took a large exhibition to Chengdu with the help of this expat uh, which was very exciting. And um, I actually took the five Oscars with me that we had won to that, at that point. And um, unbeknownst to us, this, this uh, endeavour, this sign of, I guess, generosity, um, was acknowledged by central government, and that brought us to their attention. And then just all sorts of things have happened since then. We've got to work on the two largest Chinese science fiction movies for the wonderful director Frank Gao and the producer Gear Gong, which are the Wandering Earth films. You know, they've mm -hmm. made 1.2 and 1.3 billion US dollars at the box office from mm -hmm. uh, the endeavours of those two people and their crew. Amazing opportunity. And then we've also built location-based experiences in China. We've done the world's largest um, uh, Chinese Medical Museum, Natural Herbal Medical Museum, and that's um, a chance where we actually got to design the whole building uh, it's a um, 37,000 square metre building, bigger than Tipapa. 
started off as a whiteboard drawing in my office, right? And now it stands as this huge, beautiful museum in China. Got to do all of the the development narrative research and um, art directed the fit out along with our colleague Sam Gao. And that now stands there. And then uh, through COVID, we worked on the world's largest duty-free shopping mall and got to do the Hainan Island Haiku uh, Atrium, and which that's is incredible. bonkers. Really is. Yeah, really yeah. bonkers. I'm sensing some themes here, Richard, that are to do with you and your enthusiasm and the energy that you give to what, what you do. Um, but that's surround yourself with good people. Um, it's impossible without good people because, of course, nothing can be achieved as an individual pursuit. Absolutely. You could do a small stop animation movie, you could become a book illustrator, you could become an, or, you know, an author as an individual pursuit for the most part. And, but, and a lot of these collaborations that you've had or you've started, including your journey to China, have come about because you've met people who you connect with yeah, uh, and, and form friendships with. Uh, and, and there's a mutual respect for each other. So this is what has led to success in, I think, in a sense. I think everyone is, is anyone that can't form a friendship-based relationship is probably going to struggle. They've got to, be, they've got to be a very different ilk of human being than I am because I don't have the, the cleverness or the wits to navigate my way through it without collaboration and friendship and and uh, you know a bond with someone else would you call yourself a introvert or an extrovert or somewhere in between uh, somewhere in between i think i've yeah. got over my shyness that i suffered when i was uh, in my late teens right because i've had to because you've got to yeah put yourself out there to sell your business you've had to make that work for you yeah yeah definitely as a business person yeah definitely to be able to connect with others it's important it's very important for me that i provide as much certainty as possible to the people that have been good enough to come and work with us right have chose they've got a choice they can work anywhere in the world if you're a clever person mm -hmm. they've chosen to come here and work with us so uh i I better pull finger and uh, get over the nerves and, you know, get over your own self uncertain, lack of certainty to um, get your shit together mm. and try and do it as well as you can possibly do it. Mm. Yeah. You know, you and Tanya are incredibly generous with your philanthropy and the fact that you are supporting children's causes and different causes all the time. I guess, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing in terms of that, you know, but how do you... I uh, think that has led, led to the success of what you do and the success of the people around you. Is it important? Is that just something that comes from you naturally? Well, you just do what is naturally you, right? I've always been of the view that you've got to give before you take. Um, I'd argue that our whatever our success is in interfacing with China has been um, as much about that as anything else. Right. China has had a history of Western uh, business people going in looking for what they can take. Uh, how cheaply can I get it? How quickly can I have it made? What's the quantity I can get uh, for a lesser price than I could get at home? And we've never, I've, I've never thought to think like that. I have always thought, well, what can we do? What can, mm. like Fred uh, used to, I'd say, Fred, can you, give me a quote on this collectible and he'd give me a price and I would say to him, if I was to pay you X amount more, what more could you give me in the quality that you could achieve? And he'd be stunned almost into silence because he'd never heard that. I wasn't doing it to try and be clever or manipulative or I just naturally thought that was probably a good way to do it because I knew the budget I could afford relative to what I could sell it for. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if I spent to the limit of what I could uh, pay to get it done, he then wouldn't cut corners to try and meet the low cost that he had bid on it to try and win the work. Sure. And it works out sometimes. Everybody right? wins, right? Yeah, everyone wins. Yeah, to the point you're making, what's real success in a creative company in New Zealand uh, it's the stability that your team feel in mm -hmm. a very unstable world and the mm -hmm. two big decisions that arguably 
middle working class New Zealanders make is uh, buying a home and starting a family. So I like to think about um, the measure of success here is the number of people working with us that have felt comfortable enough to buy a home. It's a very risky thing in the economy. And, um, and the thought to actively start a family so, yeah, so there's a lot of wetter babies, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. Richard, what's the future with Weta Workshop? Where do you see it going? You've diversified so much. You've had success in many areas. Um, you've provided... And some lack of success in others, right? Well, that's uh, right. Gotta, you know, it's important that people don't think that it's... You're not you always know, hitting no, high no, runs. No, 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 yeah. that's right. We, we've we cocked it up pretty well sometimes. you just got to... You know, uh, well, let me ask a question along those lines. How do you build resilience in a business like this? Well, in a, how you should build resilience is by putting some money away to weather the storms, but that's incredibly hard. You hear uh, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we haven't quite figured that one out to the degree that we should or could because, uh, you know, the, your wage bill marches on, costs march on, costs increase. So you've got to figure out how to accommodate that in your business mm -hmm. and uh, the expectations of a crew naturally to stay ahead of inflation, hopefully, um, and meet living costs in the country that they've chosen to stay working in. Uh, you know, I, I'm like all New Zealanders, probably anxious of the brain drain problem of New Zealand. And so it's beholden on someone like me and Tanya and Dave and our senior leadership to try and offer an environment where people don't want to go overseas because they can fulfill their creative uh, endeavors in this building. Yeah, but um, future thinking, uh, try and stay in business, try and stay, uh, uh, try and uh, keep, uh, uh, growing and not that doesn't mean growing there's a misconception sometimes people think that uh we must be empire builders because we've built seven different businesses under the one roof uh that's far from it we're opportunity builders definitely mm. uh, could we do the same amount as what we're doing without needing to grow in scale anymore that'd be a perfect thing um i'm trying to build a robotics vision at the moment in the workshop to try and productize a a humanoid robot for the uh, entertainment industry for for the uh, experience industry very very challenging um, you could argue it's a silly endeavor because uh, the cost of R&D and the challenges to achieve it are very very high uh, but um, I do worry that... So why do it? Oh, because you've got to break through the ceiling that you're at, right? Okay. Uh, I don't want to ever settle for the ceiling that we've reached. And uh, and even if only a small group of people are working on it within the workshop, it shows everyone in the workshop the accomplishments of a small group of people, right. which can inspire everyone, right? So Absolutely. it breaks through that yeah. ceiling. I'd love to see us develop more of our own IP. I'd love to see us... Uh, develop more in the ilk of where the workshop unleashed in Auckland mm -hmm. where we're creating location based experiences I've certainly got the ideas to build um, other location based experiences in our country that then would attract more tourism uh, traffic to come and do things that would be here so that sure. that inspires me greatly and then the other part I'd love to get much more deeply into the education of more young Kiwis. And I'd love to um, think about how we could build an academy at the workshop that keeps alive handcraft skills for young people uh, who desire not to follow an academic um, uh, career. Mm. There are thousands of kids in New Zealand that are exactly like that who may not necessarily find the uh, right fit for them in their futures. I'd love to be able to offer just one more thing in the country that might be able to um, open up that in the manner that we've built Unleashed in Auckland. The whole idea of Unleashed in Auckland 
is to demystify what we do to show you can do it too and then to uh, spark the imagination of kids that might visit and inspire them to give it a go themselves. And uh, But I think there's a there's an educational opportunity to actually achieve that even more. Mm. And that's something I'd love to explore in the, in the future too. We'll do a couple of questions. So there's a question here. There's been a lot of talk of convergence of the film, TV and games for years. How important do you think each of these industries are to each other? I keep hearing this thing about the convergence of film, TV, uh, gaming. I, there has always been a convergence, of course, because it's the aspiration to entertain people, to tell narrative through screen media, whether that's film, TV, gaming, and uh, other opportunities, a location-based experiences, a convergence ultimately. Obviously, there is a significant one when you're using a known IP that has been born out of a piece of literature or off the off a film uh, script into a game and now we're seeing the reverse where games the inspirational ideas of the writer of the original game concept has now been turned into movies and television so there's a natural crossover I don't think that it uh, I don't actually uh, feel that I'm authoritative enough to give a a very um, strong answer to this but my my gut feeling is I don't think it's really that critical. It just, the only thing that's important is that the core content, whether it's been inspired by something else or is original, is uh, fulfilling for the experience for the viewer, right? Uh, I, you know, there's this Gen Alpha's desire to uh, consume blipferts on TikTok and, well, not just Gen Alpha, all of us maybe. So isn't it lovely that there are practitioners of long-form entertainment in the form of film, TV and gaming that are hanging on and continue to make beautiful content? And I think that's all that matters. I've got a question from Nick from Miharo Innovations. He says, Richard, what are your thoughts on the future of AR glasses? Based on your time working with Magic Leap, do you see AR glasses replacing mobile phones, in some cases laptops, for work and leisure? Uh, so Nick, in answer to your question, that's an interesting one. I just grabbed this off you. I think, you know, this thing is so user friendly. You can put it away. It doesn't have to be hanging around on your face. So I don't know that that will ever be easily replaced uh, because I think most of us don't want invasive technology around us all the time. But that's not in any way to speak lesser of mixed reality and what it could mean to our lives. I was involved in Magic Leap for eight and a half years. I was one of the founding board members of Magic Leap. I went on the journey with Roni because I drank the Kool-Aid on the first day. Um, or I didn't drink it on the first day because I didn't understand it on the first day. <laughs> but once I'd flown down to Florida, put my head inside the fridge and actually seen an object in a light field and the penny dropped and I could understand what it could mean even to our work, uh, I, I knew that what Roni was creating, and I, I would argue today that no one has come close yet to what Magic Leap had already achieved six, seven years ago. Mm. Um, you know, you could argue that the latest goggles that are coming out from different companies but they're still using uh, a look-through technology as opposed to what Magic Leap were doing. Other people are now getting very close. But uh, at the height of Magic Leap, you could absolutely see that the, the, the industry-changing, groundbreaking uh, potential of what mixed reality could mean, the fact that you can blend and remove uh, things from the world mm. that you want in it or out of it, um, whether that's navigational tools, uh, translation tools, educational tools, but also the prolific level of education. Just imagine what mixed reality could do to the experience economy. Go to a theme park, you go to Galaxy's Edge, mm. and instead of looking up at the California sky, you can paint it into the a galaxy of any known uh, story within the Star Wars universe. And th what's the biggest um, problem of Galaxy's Edge, as is the problem with all theme park theming, 
we're in it, right? Just everyday people in their casual clothing are breaking the fourth, you know, they've broken the illusion because mm. we're in it. Mm. So imagine the ability for mixed reality to remove things, including other people, or at least dresses or as Ewoks or whatever we desire to be. Um, so to me, mixed reality hasn't yet fulfilled its promise to the world, but at its heart, as Roni visualized it, I think it could be still be the singularly ma- most transformative piece of technology that is acquirable in the next few years. I don't see it replacing the cell phone and the computer anytime soon. This is a very usable piece of technology. The fact you can actually put it away mm-hmm. and not have it invasive in your life. But um, you could see a time when the general public have got to the point that they're comfortable enough, uh, as we are in sunglasses or reading glasses, uh, to be able to wear a lightweight pair of mixed reality uh, spectacles a lot of their time because it just adds so fundamentally to their their IQ, their, mm. um, their awareness, their capability. Mm. As someone known for groundbreaking physical effects, what do you think the gaming industry can learn from film and television in terms of storytelling, character design, and world building? Oh, boy, I, I think the game industry has learned all of those lessons. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, so there may be people watching that would fundamentally disagree with me, but I look at the, the level of concept. I mean, we do concept design on games as almost as frequently as we design film and television. So mm. exactly the same people that have designed the movies that we've worked on are designing the games that you'll be playing next year because the game, uh, the people that are facilitating the making of these games put as much focus and importance on good design, good narrative, good storytelling, good characterization uh, as they do in a film these days. Obviously, there could be a scale that you could argue, but if you're if you're taking like for like, so I I don't know that you could learn anything, but I guess to answer the question without being so um, quick off the mark, we focus on evolving plausible ecologies. Uh, that's one of our trademarks. If a director comes to us and wants an implausible ecology, of course we will design that. We're trying to evoke a sense of plausible ecology so that the, the storyteller can choose where to create uh, moments in the story that have um, a freedom from reality, that um, that uh, break away from the suspension of disbelief, right, uh, or, or embrace the suspension of disbelief, because the things that we're designing are as plausible as they can be to the ecology of the world in which they sit in. There is... Uh, a need for us to understand very specific things about a world so we can design into it appropriately. Uh, And that's things like, what's the gravity like? What's the air content like? At its heart, we're trying to make sure that the um, ecology has rules that keep it uh, grounded for an audience. And maybe that's something that uh, certain game designers uh, could heed relative to their IPs, right? There's some games that don't want any rules. They're completely out there, potentially. But the sort of games that we would be able to design are games that have that essence within it. I think that's a great answer because there's some of the most successful films and ha- have had this ecology built in, you know, which leads the to the, the Lord of the Rings is, the Rings is a phenomenal perfect, example yeah. of it. Peter Jackson said to us, got to feel like you've got off at the Lord of the Rings airport, at the Middle Earth airport, just like you get off at the Auckland airport or the Singapore airport. The game industry in New Zealand has grown substantially in recent years. It was announced just yesterday that in the last 12 months, the New Zealand game industry has earned $550 million, up from $434 million the, the year before last. How do you see this momentum continuing? And what opportunities and should developers focus on to keep this growth sustainable? Uh, well, all I can, you know, it, it is our hope that it will continue. 
because it would be a wonderful thing for the country. It would be an amazing endorsement for the early pioneers of the New Zealand gaming industry. You know, people like the team at Pickpock, uh, the Grinding Gear Games team, uh, the Cerebral Fix team down in the South Island. There's so many groups that were there at the beginning and pushing, pushing, pushing for this. And for the specific individuals in the game industry who have fought so vigilantly to be recognised uh, alongside the other creative industries as a future viable earner for the country. And what you've just read out is proof of that. And uh, it's very hard to achieve success in a country of the scale of ours without uh, community, governmental, regional support. And we've all been very thankful for it and uh, acknowledge it and uh, appreciate it every day that we work because uh, it, it generates employment for a large group of people in a field that then can uh, mark our culture on the world stage. And that's an important part of a country's very existence, its very being, right? And uh, therefore, the thought that our gaming industry continues to grow and be part of that and be a critical component in the ongoing New Zealand creative story is something that we've got to continue to support, fight for, be behind, uh, champion, and uh, be as hopeful as possible for, can generate um, incredibly dynamic jobs for a very large number of New Zealand creatives, especially young people that have uh, embraced uh, technology to the highest degree in their educational journey. How lovely now for them to be fulfilled in their future careers because they're getting to do something that's played by millions, uh, um, celebrated by millions, and, um, and uh, promotes further development of other games that others will play on into the future. So it's, it can only be a good thing. And finally, Richard, I have to talk about Tales of the Shire. Um, it's a fantastic collaboration with Private Division. How excited are you to release this game next year? Oh, we're extremely excited to be releasing this game. It's been a long journey for us, a very hard uh, fought journey to get it as beautiful as we can make it, right? We are... Uh, We'd never made a game like this when we first started on it. Uh, we were learning from the ground up to some degree. And the small, young team of people that have put this together have put it together with an incredible passion and desire to do the best they possibly can, both by the game but also by um, the legacy of Tolkien and the legacy of our involvement in, in, Tolkien, uh, in Tolkien's world. Uh, so, um, you know, Steve Lambert, who is one of our senior designers at Weta Workshop, has been involved in most projects that we've done. He has uh, masterminded the visual look of the world and the fact that you can go and be a cosy hobbit in a cosy hobbit Sims game has got to be very special to, to most people that just love to, you know, enjoy the simple life and everything that the hobbits represent and stand for, so... Richard Taylor, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Thank you very much for joining us no in worries. the Game Developers community. Good stuff. I hope it goes well. Pleasure. Thank Cheers. you. Well, thank you so much to Richard Taylor for his time this morning. It's been fantastic talking to him and learning more about the inside story of Weta Workshop and his journey through it. Uh, for more information about Weta Workshop, you can obviously go to the website wetaworkshop.com. And if you want to keep an eye on what's happening with Tales of the Shire, talesoftheshire.com. It releases in March 2025. Thank you very much.